Embarking on the journey of transitioning from the familiar confines of secondary education to the uncharted territories of adulthood can be daunting for any student. For families of students with disabilities, this process presents a unique set of challenges and uncertainties. As your child prepares on stepping into the world beyond, it's natural to feel overwhelmed by the myriad of decisions and considerations that lie ahead. And that is what we're here to talk about. Welcome. This is the Post-Secondary Transition Podcast. We have conversations around that process of transition for families of students with disabilities. I'm one of the hosts. My name is Megan Smallwood, and I'm a public school transition coordinator. And with me is... My name is Patrick Cadigan. I am a public school special education teacher. And this week, we are headed right back into the uh, very familiar format, the interview format. And Megan, do you want to set us up? I would love to. Today, we have one of the fabulous transition specialists for our county who I work alongside with and is just ball of energy and always willing to go above and beyond for everybody, uh, Meredith Gregora Cope. And I realize I never actually say your full last name. We always call you GC. So yes, <laughs> hopefully I said that right. Gregory. Cope. <laughs> it's it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. GC is just much easier. I feel like. <laughs> to start, I know a little bit about your background, Meredith, but do you mind telling us a little bit of where you started with your journey into special education? Yeah. So I am Howard County, born and raised. I grew up in Maryland. And so for me, one of the things that I guess you can say was a privilege that we got to do uh, if we earned the right was to be able to help out and volunteer in the special education class. So I was really excited. I always got to do that. And my dad, when I was 12 years old, told me, pick a job and stick to a kid. He's like old school angry man from uh, New York. And so that was it. I just, I wanted to be a special ed teacher. So I went to Notre Dame, Maryland and graduated with um, a dual degree in special ed and gen ed. Yeah. I moved to my current county and elementary school was uh, my big thing. And I actually, my first placement was in elementary school and I actually got to move to working with uh, our director Terry Savage. And I really was impressed with the way with her leadership. And she told me I should work as a team leader. And I was able to do that at another elementary school for six years. And I learned a lot about myself and a lot about leadership, but I really felt like I wanted to work in transition. I found out about that. And I feel like, and I'm sure you'll, you know, agree, Megan, there's not a lot of information about what a transition teacher does. Um, And I feel like, Um, we're learning more about that as we go along. And I had to get my foot in the door first by moving to high school and working in a position of just being in one of our local only programs. So I, I was able to do that, um, get my foot in the door for a couple of years and then slide into the transition position into that same secondary position there. And now I'm um, moving into my third year there. So I'm, getting into like my 21st year, I feel like of teaching now. I'm like getting super old. Transition is, I feel like the highlight of my life. I am like so excited in um, that position. I really love job development and working with diploma and certificate students and just really understanding the differences between the two jobs. I really feel like my passion is really working with the certificate side of students. Um, and I'm, I, I guess people describe me as someone who really thinks outside of the box. And I feel like that's not the most typical side of a transition teacher. <laughs> I really feel like I'm kind of on the outside of things, which is where that comes from. But I have really enjoyed trying to look at in our county how we can help our students who are going down the certificate path find access to what their passion is when it comes to jobs. So I know everyone can't see me, but I was like nodding like crazy. Like when you're like, yeah, I I think tend to think outside the box because that's I think my favorite thing about you. Like you definitely cross the lines in a good way of like getting people on board with those like ideas that normally I think traditionally we wouldn't consider. So I love that. And I think we need more of that in our county. I think COVID really opened our eyes to thinking about what 
we are able to do for our friends with disabilities. If we realize what COVID did for us, it really made us think it stopped jobs for us. Not It made us really think like, oh my God, we, there's so many jobs that we don't have anymore just for typical adults and, and people. Like there were so many, we were stifled from jobs and so many people were forced to work from home and people want to continue to work from home. And now I feel like there's even still people are trying to find jobs and so many places don't have opportunities now, but you have to realize how many more opportunities our, our adults with disabilities don't have now because of COVID. And that's really stifled our programs inside of the school building and even more so in our agencies and even more so for our adults that have not been able to go back to our agencies. So we're so far behind in these opportunities that it has required the people that are willing to take the risk, like myself and Megan and some of our other transition teachers, to really think of how can we get the people in inside of our county to extend themselves and really be flexible in their thinking to give these students and these adults an opportunity to to work. And I think you're right. Like, I think since COVID, it's almost kind of like a competition amongst us and the other agencies and whoever else is out there for these jobs because they became a little more limited. And we're all like after the same goal. But it really I think you've done such a good job of really like going out and researching and finding those other opportunities that people might not have thought about. And I think that's something important to mention, too, Um, especially we've talked about this before with a lot of our self-directed friends you know, thinking not just only going into a business, but what can I bring into my own home to help a business? Because I think that was something we really had to rely on a lot when we returned to the school building and we couldn't get out there. You know, I think you you found a lot of jobs that we could bring into them and they would work and then we would bring it back. So it's still that that relationship just in a different format, but you're still connected to the community in another way. Yeah, I think and Patrick, I don't know if you know this, but one of my my favorite things when it was, we were in the heat of COVID, right? And so I worked for, I work in a school where I think our, our parents were, you know, they were so scared of what COVID was going to do for us, but they still were like, hey, listen, we still need something for our students to do. Like, you still need to get on the grind. We don't know what COVID is. We don't know what's going to happen, but guess what? You're their case manager and you're still going to find us something to do. And I was like, uh, I have a baby at home and I'm not leaving this house. And I was like, wear a mask and I would have <laughs> wore a hazmat suit if you'd let me. But I just heard of this amazing teacher named Megan Smallwood and I was going to ask her whatever I needed to do. And and I found this subscription box, am I, am I allowed to say? And one of them was how to be a chef, or I'm a chef too. And what can I think of the other one now that we My pre-K you? box? Yeah, my pre-K box. Shout out to both of them. And they were very small companies at the time. And I just randomly reached out to them through social media. And I was like, hey, I am a teacher in so-and-so county. And, um, you know, I noticed that you're basically working, a working from home mom you used to be a teacher. Can I have these students that will work for free for you? Can we just put together your subscription materials for you? And they were like, uh, yeah. And I was like, okay. And so I would meet my students at my school and sit 10 feet away from them. And I would meet the ladies and just grab the boxes give it to the students and they were like just materials for like students two through six the other one were was edibles like foods that would uh, create instructional materials so i couldn't give it to all my students and we worked for them and it spiraled into like working for our our work company that we have through our school system and um, one of them ended up on shark tank and so they turned into a million dollar company so we can't work for them anymore but the other <laughs> one she lets us still work for them, but the we even have Megan works for the works with the the mother. Um, she works for her husband foundation, mm-hmm. and her son actually is employed through that company and gets paid for them to work. And so we're like building these relationships that are helping students feel accomplished and that they're doing meaningful work every single day. And I think that's the most important thing, Megan, and I always talk to these these companies for because they say, oh, I feel guilty that we're we're mm-hmm. using, you know, your these students work. And it's like, no, you don't understand. These kids feel accomplished. They're building work employment skills. They can use it on their resumes when they leave here at 21 and they're trying to find work moving forward. But also these are huge employability skills that they didn't have when they're sitting in the classroom and they're trying to build vocation skills. And this is part of their educational like curriculum in a sense. You know, I think we just 
discuss this with one of the the places that they were volunteering um and there was a little pushback about having them come volunteer because yeah. it's for free but it's it's their education you know i know it looks different and i think it's still not so accepted by everybody or understood by everybody but like you said they practice all these skills in in the building i mean think about them doing that for 6 or 7 years they're going to get bored. Like, okay, here's the same pencil I'm sharpening. Like, but if they know it's going into a box, it's being delivered to kids who are actually using it for something. It's just, yeah, like you said, so meaningful. Um, and I remember that phone call over COVID time when you called me and you had these ideas and I'm like, oh my gosh, she talks very quickly. <laughs> Still to this day. But, but I, I think mean, it's if- like all those out of the box thinking like, honestly, I, I literally just had, um, they're doing bingo night at my kid's elementary school and I'm on the committee and I'm like, we can take care of those folders for you. So now I have my students packing up the manila folders for bingo. I don't know if you're going, Patrick, but if you do. Your bingo cards will be packed together by our students. So um, there's just so many out-of-the-box jobs like that. So one question then that I have, Meredith, is do you have like a process like in terms of how do you come up with the ideas for it? Are you – do you start with your student and then work your way out or how does it – how does that work? No, my – (laughs) <laughs> unfortunately my brain it's like one of those you know those beautiful mind type things where he's like writing the the mathematician like example on the board and and I actually think that's what's the best thing about it is that I'm not a selfish person when it comes to these ideas and and I actually was very fortunate today with our uh this year with our supervisor she allowed me to work for one of our programs which is community connections so we have several levels of independence um, in our programs, which I think is amazing. And I and this is another level of things that we're working on, uh, Megan, myself, and our transition teachers and in, in, in special education is we have different levels that we want to see an independence for our students in our work programs. Um, and there should be an, a nice flow of independence in our programs. And that's something that we consistently talk about and that we want to see levels of independence for our students in our work programs and why we're always thinking of different work sites and how they could function for students, right? Because it's, again, there's, it's an IDP, right? Is, is for each student. You don't just put each student in a box and that's how it's going to fit. A work site also should not, you can't just put every single kid into a work site. So if you think about just our our one work site that is staffed for students who need more support, we have over a hundred students in those work sites. But as we get more and more independent, those should be individualized. So As Megan and I have come on together, you know, this is only like my third year working as a transition teacher. We've been fortunate enough to work and create independent work sites. And then we think of like community connections is over at the college and and those two should be independent work sites. And then we think of even Project Search, which is the most independent and should be government jobs. But again, with COVID, that hasn't been the case as well. So we've also tried to extend resources where we've reached out to people in the community for those sites. So my mother-in-law works um, or she's on the board for the ARC. So when I went to the chocolate ball, for example, I was just trying to randomly reach out to people and just say, hey, oh, you're working for this. Would you meet with Megan and I just to discuss opportunities of, of where we could possibly have our students working or volunteering with you for here or anytime I'm at the grocery store? It's, it's really... I think Megan might have told me one time, when you are in a area where you know people or where you feel comfortable with people, your everyday life, those are the people that know you the best. Those are the people you want to reach out and make connections with. Because if they know who you are as a person, they know you at the core. Yeah, Meredith talks a lot and Meredith's a little like crazy, but you know Meredith's a good person. So you trust Meredith. And if you trust Meredith, then you will give her the opportunity to have her students work for you and volunteer with you. And I've been able to make really good connections for the county and for our work programs because of that. And that's something I always tell my parents when they're looking, especially for our self-directed parents. That's something I always tell the transition teachers. That's something I always tell the CCE teachers, it's and it, it's almost like a web, right? It extends, extends, extends. So when I'm out in the community, I try to do that. When I just extend myself and a friendly hello or a smile, 
the worst thing that can happen is they say no to me. The best thing is I make another job for us or connection. And I think that's been a huge way that we've gotten a lot of jobs for our work program because we have someone's husband works at a church or somebody's Mm -hmm. mother, you know, goes to the store, whatever it may be. So I think it's just a matter, like you said, of just being out in your community and recognizing, oh, they could use our help doing this. And it could be the simplest mundane task, but it's something that our students have been working towards and it would be meaningful to them. I think it's just to the... Megan, myself, and and a couple other of us, we honestly think it is so crucial and so important to the success of these students that we put 100% in every single day to find different careers and different um, opportunities, opportunities, yeah. not just the same thing for them. And I yeah. think that's what a good transition teacher does. A good transition teacher will look at all different areas. Right. It's not just continue. custodial. And there's no. some some friends that love some cleaning a window. We know that's not for everybody. And yeah, that's why I think it's so important. We're always scouring like the internet or just looking at different stores to see, you know, what other field we can capture. And I think, um, I know summer's coming and a lot of times around this time of the year, I have families who are looking for job opportunities over the summer. And I'm always like, well, what about like where you go to church? What about in the neighborhood? What about people that you know? Is there anything that they could help them with? Like, and it's just like that first step to naturally think of your circle of support and Mm -hmm. any potential opportunities there. Um, because that's really going to be helpful too when they exit at 21. You know, you've got those connections already made. And like you said before, I think that trust is really big because I know when we start a relationship with a new business, we often have to like, it's like when you're first dating and you're like, all right, is this really going to work? Like we got to yeah. see, you got to feel it out. Um, and then once you build that trust in that relationship, they're like, sure, you know, come more, bring more. You know, so it's, it's really like, you know, a little song and dance you have to go through first. Meredith, one question that I do have, and you kind of hit the nail on the head earlier when we first started in the conversation, that in this, in a lot of the discussions that we have had, we concentrate a lot on our students who are either not on the the diploma track or who have uh, special needs, significant special needs. However, there is a large contingent of the population, our diploma-bound friends, and you said You've enjoyed getting to know the differences between the two. Could you speak briefly then about what does that look like like for you as somebody who's just getting into this? Yeah. And I think for me, doors and then the work, the workforce center training. And I have to say, I we also have a new position this year, the I always say it wrong now, like the CCR, CR, they, they changed their name like all over the place. But College and career readiness. Career readiness. I think I have the best one of the bunch. I call him the gits. Okay. But so he is just the best. He's like my big muscle man. He, he is just a vast amount of resource. Like right now, he just invited me to come um, on four field trips that he's taking. So he really has been a wealth of knowledge about like career path connectors and exposing the kids to like different trade schools that are coming up. Megan did an amazing job with the field trip we just took for HCC for juniors and seniors that the transition teachers put together, which is amazing. I love working with Diane Nagel over at HCC. I think it's just so impactful. And I I think since Megan took it over the past, it's two years now, I just think it has improved a hundredfold that I think the kids have gotten so much out of it. I immensely, you know, have just, I'm falling in love with HCC more and more each year um, for me. And then doors I have. So each of us as the transition teachers, we have a doors rep for each of our schools and mine's Jillian Steinart. And I, I just love Jillian. She is so present in each of the IP meetings that we have. And she, she attends my IP meetings for freshmen, which I don't always listen. Doors is going to have a different relationship with, with each of their, the people that they work with. I find Jillian to be extremely responsive, extremely communicative. And with your doors rep, they really, depending on the relationship, depending on the communication you have with that person, they're able to kind of share what resources are available for that student. They're able to share what programs that that student is eligible for and really talk about what path they're going to go down. And I have found her to be so helpful again with with what is going on so like we had a student that was really interested in doing like um the weeble which is 
like a path where they can go on like a, a certain amount of week program where they're working in a different location and there's opportunities to get paid. And she was able to walk the student and the, and the parent was present in the meeting. The student is present. I, I was welcome to be present. And it was just so open. The communication was amazing. And I, I really enjoyed that whole conversation we were able to do right there. So for me, being able to see that the Workforce Training Center they're offering a really nice summer internship program that's paid. You can work from home. If that works better, you can work in different uh, locations. And again, that's something that the gets offered to me too, that uh, he was handing out flyers for. I'm sorry, I don't have to call him that way. So I really like that co-teaching. I, I call it co-teaching, but that's something we're doing together too. Well, it's so, like that partnership, like, and, and right. contacting all your resources. And I think that's what's so important for like a good transition teacher to realize, like, you're not expected to know it all, but you're right. expected to go out and find the information and share the information. That's the thing, right? I think the one thing I'm really good at is like, I don't know all the answers. And if I don't, then I yeah. will find them. And I'll say like, here, I can find it for you. And I think that's Gitterman is really great at like uh, honing in on what he knows. Um, his wife is also over at the college. She does the Jumpstart program. And so he's oh. really invested in that piece as well. So I, I really do enjoy working with him. I That's him another great. resource he brings in then. <laughs> Only agree. So. But yeah, um, I think that's like, that's something I tell parents too. Like, I'm not sure, but I love going down the rabbit hole and finding the information. And honestly, it's helped so much. Like every little situation that I've encountered, I just keep like a, a document or, you know, a folder. And I'm like, oh, wait, I have looked this up before. And then it comes to use for another parent. So yeah. It's everything so individualized, but you can at least lead them to the right person. I, I also, too, like I have enjoyed with these completer paths, really learning a lot more about ARL and also the apprenticeships mm -hmm. this year. I'm really excited because we actually were able to get one of our certificate students over at ARL for next year, which I, I know it's like a little bit off track, Patrick, what you were saying, but just understanding what apprenticeships are and what ARL offers to our students. I wish, too, that we could just extend and get so much more of our students. but. You know, it's just understanding what they bring to our students. Real quickly, for those of us who don't know uh, ARL, what is what is that? The Applied Research Lab. Um, and there's just a variety. There's, oh God, I want to say, is there like 12 or 13? Different, different career academies for students who are interested in a specific path. And they're really great because they give the students like opportunities to have internships, certifications, to leave school already like you know, ready to go and in, into that field a lot of times. And you do have to apply though in your sophomore year and you do find out in your sophomore year if you um, make it and then you do go junior year, you go the first two periods of the day, senior year, the last two, two and a half, right? Depending mm -hmm. on the half day off. Yep. Half, half day off campus from your, your regular school. All right. And then I wanted to, because I, I have to admit in the back of my head, I have been having this question my understanding, and I think I remember seeing it something about it on Facebook, you had an opportunity, you helped out the Washington Capitals? Oh, yes. Okay, and look, I'm not even, I am not, Molly Milani is one of our best, 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 best. I call her my inclusion special teacher, but everyone always calls them the resource ones, which I think is the weirdest. Oh, I just call them the gen ed special educator. Right, okay, gen ed special educator. So she actually has a connection with the capital. So she actually reached out and she actually just, she's the one that got us the um, real estate thing as well. I'll talk about that next too. But again, so it's, it's like the team working together to, to get that. She, yeah, she tagged them on social media and they sent it out and she brought it in and it was like 5,000 pieces of work that was just put together. But again, it was, I think it was like two or three weeks of work for us. But again, it was just thinking outside of the box. She randomly came up to us and was like, hey, do you think this is something you guys would be interested in? It's probably boring for you. And I was like, are you out of your mind? Like, I was like, this is something that would be so meaningful to them. And again, for our students, we have a, a couple of students who find motor is an issue for them. And they enjoyed it so much because it was almost like we just had a systematic train running, right? And they got it done in two weeks and they were blown away they actually sent the kids like what do you call that like flare like free stuff and then i was i actually called megan i think what last week because we had a real estate agent who mm -hmm. i have been working with and molly had been working with and we had a staff member that used to work at our school and they were like oh we really need some help 
And because she reached out to us, she had 12 other real estate agents that are also wanting to work with us. And so they're just like bombarding us with stuff now. So it's like, you just tell one person, something. she was like, you are literally saving my marriage. And I was like, no, no, you are saving my life. And she was like, we're going to send you pizzas every week. I was like, well, that's not, that's not going to help my thighs lady. So I, you know, it's just like, but it's, you know, just the, these opportunities where people are so overwhelmed by tasks that they Mm -hmm. find, like you said, you know, I don't want to say mundane or they find tedious. They're they're just tedious and tasks are taking hours upon hours of their day. And we talked about it that our students who right now are in the classroom and they're not able to go out to work yet because we can't send our our little ones out to work until junior senior year these are amazing tasks for them mm-hmm. because we're really able to collect data and say hey we're starting to notice that so and so are showing independence they're showing the time on task is up to 30 to 45 minutes. We're showing they're able to follow multi-step directions. Like they would be great for us to send out to the workforce or the opposite. Because when we have these parents that say to us, I want them out to work immediately. Mm -hmm. We're like, Hey, let me show you this data collection we have. There's a couple things we're noticing X, Y, and Z that are concerning for us. I just was able to get a connection with the 4-H group. And that's been amazing this year. They've been able to come in and work with our guys, working with nature and building and developing crafts with the kids, but they're also working on finance skills with them. They want to come back and actually expand. I'm, of course, I'm always going to look for Megan and you know expand into her school. My sister works at another high school. She d- goes out to work. So uh, we're going to try and get into her school too. And we're going to try and write a grant as well to get funding done in the high schools to expand. So for me, it's like, you know, there's limitless ends. It's just, I need to try and slow my brain down. But for me, I just think these kids need to be out at work all the time because, you know, you got to think about the fact that seven, six, seven years is a really Mm -hmm. long time to be stuck in a classroom. Well, um, you're trying to set them up for real life. Well, yeah. Because, I mean, I think we've, if we tallied, I'd love to know how many of our friends, especially Mm -hmm. the self-directed path, Mm-hmm. have productive jobs afterward. And that's that's what I really do worry about for our friends is... Um, well, and I think it's also giving, like, parents, you know, the ability to see they, they're they capable. I think so many times, and even I see a lot of special educators, they're stuck on a job, has to be 9 to 5, 40 hours a week, you know, Monday yeah. through Friday. So I think it's just changing that mindset and realizing a job could be a couple hours a day working at home or in, you know, in, in a store or something doing this task. And that is a meaningful job. That is their like good life. So I think it's just parents realizing that and seeing that before they leave and yeah. um, knowing that their, their child has a purpose in that. Based on the conversations that we've had also uh, between ourselves and then also with some of the parents that we talked to, I also feel like the word that comes to my mind when we have that discussion is agency, like knowing that they can, you know, make an impact or, you know, have some ideas. Uh, I always go back to the conversation that we had with Pam. Pam would just walk out in public and be like, hey, who's going to employ my kid? Yep. And, yep. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, and she was serious about it too. Yeah, and it's yeah. so admirable because she's like, yeah, he can work, put him to work. And I still remember like when she was talking about like when he was hired and the the person he was working for had a question, Um, they just called up Pam and she's like, just tell him to do it. And it was just like a matter of wording, but it was something so simple to get through, you know, and they were willing to. So I I do wish, and I think this is something we struggle with in the school system with with family sometimes is our ability to have warm, open conversations sometimes. And I, I know that our families get, you know, especially when they get towards the end, the anxiety builds and sometimes trust is hard. And Mm -hmm. I just wish we could have more thoughtful, easier conversations. And that is the one thing that's, that's hard for me is um, the reality of what's coming next for them. And I, yeah. I don't know how to bring their guard down sometimes. And we could just get through all the muck of it and kind of just say like, Hey, can please like, just kind of show them a crystal ball, of, like what it's going to look like if we just don't break it down. And yeah. um, 
hoping more people can listen to your podcast. And I think like sometimes they like, you know, it's like, listen, listen, or, you know, just try. But I think one of the things though that goes back to that and uh, when you were saying earlier again was about trust. Um, I, as I was focusing in on the, I've been in the school system now for seven years and I've been fortunate enough to build relationships with families of the students that I work with that we've had some pretty hard conversations and it goes to show a level of trust when you can openly have those conversations and but it is not it is not easy it is not easy and um some and sometimes are, it takes having that conversation and letting it sink in and letting yeah. them come back when they're ready yeah. for more yeah. some are some are more willing to have the conversation than others but yeah mm-hmm. again just the fact that it's being brought up and kind of like hey <laughs> this is something that we should be thinking about yeah. I've had parents tell me that like we'd sit down when their child was like 14 or 15 and I'd go through the timeline and tell them some of the things that might not be easy to hear about, you know, when you're gone and this and that. And I've had them come back years later and they're like, you know, I didn't want to hear that, but <laughs> you said it mm-hmm. and it stuck in the back of my mind and I knew it had to come around. And eventually when I was ready, like I knew what I was facing. So it, it's, I think we always struggle with that. We've had this conversation about like trying to get down to the middle school when they're really young and start the conversations then, but it really comes down to who's ready to hear it. And even if they, if we don't think they're ready to hear it, they act like they don't, they're not ready to hear it. Some of that information is still getting in there, you know, just presenting it to them. I think, you know, it's just slowly seeping in, but it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be thought about early on. Well, thank you, Meredith, for all that information. I know you could go on and on, and I'm sure tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. I'll get a text from you. Oh, wait, I should have mentioned this. (laughs) We can always add it in later. (laughs) But we appreciate all your hard work and your out-of-the-box thinking, and you are such a tremendous um, um, support to these families, and they're very lucky to have you. Thank you. All right. And well, with that being said, I, as usual, when we have conversations like this, I always feel like we're just scratching the surface and we probably could do some more again. So <laughs> of course we're probably going to do more again. Um, but in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, uh, we need you to do us a favor. We need you to like, follow, please share out the podcast. We want to share out the information from these discussions with as many families as we can, and we need your help to do it. We're on all the major podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, just to name a few. So go out, find us, share out the information. Find the information, including links to resources from this and other conversations in our show notes. They can be found at our podcast website at www.p2transition.com. Check out our YouTube channel. Now, we've done some of the legwork for you by curating videos of topics that revolve around transition. We have playlists. They cover guardianship, alternatives to guardianship, ABLE accounts, and there is still more to come. So be sure to subscribe there as well. And then finally, check out our redesigned website. It is chock full of information around the transition process. You can find our contact information there and so much more. So definitely go to www.postsecondarytransition.com. And I think that we can finish out this discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. All right. And we will catch up with you guys soon with more conversations to come. Thanks so much. Thank you.